seen tonight in order to bring you the following special program. 40 Magic Years, Bay Area Television is brought to you by KSAN. Discover today's country. KSAN, 94.9 FM. By Blue Cross of California, we care about what's good for you. By Panasonic, just slightly ahead of our time. By Marine World Africa USA in Vallejo. And by BMW, the ultimate driving machine. from San Francisco, and on 40 years of film and videotape from across America, the Bay Area's TV birthday celebration. It was right here the television was born, Jack. 202 Green Street. On this site, the 21-year-old Philo T. Farnsworth, the genius of Green Street, had his laboratory. Yeah, and it was right here in 1927 that Philo Farnsworth invented the world's first electronic television system. But it would be another 22 years before Philo's brainchild made it into homes here in the Bay Area. And it was May 1949 when the station that you're watching right now, KGO-TV, went on the air. And now we have broadcast from modern studios only two blocks from this, the birthplace of television. Jack. You're telling me in all those years of broadcasting, we only come two blocks? Jack, come on. The Is that what you're telling started. me? We're late for the party. Don't tell me about the party. Just Don't tell me about the broadcasting. Welcome to the party. 40 magic years of Bay Area TV. Featuring San Francisco's super shows and superstars. from the television archives, moments from those programs you loved and laughed with, the personalities you grew up with, the events that were part of your life during 40 magic years. Here are your hosts, Russ Coughlin and Jack Hansen. Thank you. Thank you. Boy, May 1949, what was life like on that day when KTO TV first went on the air? Here's a little 30-second refresher course for you. Harry Truman was president, yep, Jay. Right. The NATO alliance was being born. Russia had not yet tested its first atomic bomb. And Preston Tucker's dream of a new automobile, the Tucker Torpedo, had collapsed. Yeah, and Frank Fay was starring on stage at the Kern Theater in Harvey. And over at the Tivoli Theater, it was vaudeville headlined by Dude Martin. You remember Dude? Oh, Dude. And his old Roundup Gang, the most popular movie in town, was Take Me Out to the Ball Game, starring Frank Sinatra, Gene Kelly, and Esther Williams. And movies have improved. A loaf of bread <laughs> cost you just 15 cents. A bottle of Coke was a nickel. A new suit, not like that one, would set you back 50 bucks. 50 bucks. A Cadillac was $5,000, and you could fill it up for 25 cents a gallon. Still paid $50 for that one. Yeah. I know you did. And a television set would run you from $350 to $500. Some said this was a passing fancy, sort of a novelty, but lots of others were eager to buy one of those 8 or 10-inch models. Like the rest of America, we were fascinated. In 1949, they were being mass-produced for the first time 100,000 a week, all made in America. At RCA, Crosley, Packard Bell, Westinghouse, Admiral, Motorola. When KGO went on the air, there were already over 5,000 sets right here in the Bay Area. KPIX had begun broadcasting just a few months before, and now, with a second local station, Channel 7, appliance dealers were predicting a bonanza in the sales of TV sets. Of course, many of those were not in living rooms. Most people were still getting their first look at television in the neighborhood bar or looking in the window of the corner furniture store. A family with a TV set of its own was assured of lots of company. When the king of TV the was Uncle Milty, and for those of you too young to remember what a service station was really like, the guys introducing Burl are meant to represent Texaco's servicemen, who washed your windshield and checked your water and oil and tires before filling your tank. All of that is now ancient history. Milton! And there were others on their way up, including a young guy from radio named Arthur Godfrey. What we're trying to do is see whether or not these characters here and me will make a television show. It was something new for all of us. And as the years went along, we got only slightly more sophisticated. And one of the first really big timers to have a regular show out of San Francisco was a singer with a very laid-back country Jim. style. Hello, Dee Pickard. Happy 84th birthday to Mrs. Gippy Williams in Bagwell, Texas. Happy birthday. Hello, Dee Pickard. 
Ernie may have had slow and droll country ways, but his show was often sheer insanity. And right in the middle of that bedlam was a young disc jockey who ran over from KSFO every day to be Tennessee's television sidekick. Everybody say blue again. When the blue. Oh, Ern. And then to recall those great days with Ernie Ford, there's another guy who's everybody's buddy. I should be dancing. But yeah, that's like, oh, that was, they're better yeah. than the Ernie Ford band. Now, wait a minute, you started singing, is that right, on the show? I tr Twice I tried to sing on yeah. television, both on Channel 7, uh, way back, 1958. I don't know if anybody remembers a show called Bright and Easy. No. And it turned to no. bright and early. Yeah. Uh, Freddie Jorgensen, Ardeen DeCamp, and yeah. George Cerruti in the band. And one day they were going to sing the song Heart. And I was their announcer, and they wanted me to sing one line. They rehearsed me, and they rehearsed me, and they rehearsed <laughs> My line was you can open any door. Mm -hmm. Now, the guys in the band are not going to like this, but because I'm going to sing. I may not like it either, Jim, okay. but that's it. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. everybody was singing their part. Everything was perfect until they got to me, and they pointed, and I went, you can open any door. <laughs> and the band stopped playing. They fell on the floor. That was the one time. The other time, yeah. Ernie yeah. tried to get me to sing, yeah. and... Uh, <laughs> And they all realized I couldn't carry a tune. Now, you know how that is. Well, I know how it is. And your wife, Nancy, over there, who'll be out in a little while, said, oh, not the you can open any door story again. That's, <laughs> I don't there. know what this is. They said, give this to Jim Lang. He'll know what this is. It's a present for you. And Jim, thank you very much. OK. There you go. Oh, okay. beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Russ Coglin, you have to come on in here now, because it's your turn. I was I always liked the singing. I thought he was a good singer. But if Tennessee Ernie was the most laid-back performer to headline a nationwide show out of San Francisco, and his opposite number would have to be the unpredictable, completely goofy, madcap, Gypsy Rose Lee. This, this is hanging up behind the counter. And there stands my butcher, proudly, in front of this sign. <laughs> Now, I don't mind the New York, and I don't really mind the stripper, but look up in the left-hand corner. It's that age. Well, no one is sore, and certainly no one who worked with her will ever forget Gypsy Rose Lee. She was absolutely one of a kind. And during the time that Gypsy was doing her show, right here from the Channel 7 studios in San Francisco, her, her son was busy. He was serving in the United States Army overseas. The last Gypsy Rose Lee show was done from here. In March of 1968, and Gypsy herself died in 1970. She was a victim of cancer. But her son is here now with KGO, the entertainment reporter for Good Morning Bay Area. Let's have a nice welcome for Eric Lee Preminger. Eric? Hey! What, when you see your mother's shows like this, what kind of a reaction do you have? Oh, I, listen, it's, it's wonderful for me because I didn't see so many of them. Yeah. Now, you know, when I was on leave, however, I used to have to come up here and do the show with her. And, you know, they had no budget for the show at all. And, but they did have a suite at the plaza that they sort of got on a trade deal. So, and she'd written me sort about this. Sort of a trade this, deal. Sort of a trade yeah, deal. Yeah. And they'd, uh, yeah. she'd written me about this. And yeah. I was th looking forward to staying at the plaza. And we arrived. And this was when the studios were over on Golden Gate Avenue. Mm -hmm. And she checks us into this little tenderloin hotel. Mm -hmm. I said, is this a short story, Eric? Yeah, it's I almost just... over. I said, where is the suite? And she uh -huh. says, oh, Eric, I let my guests stay there. This is closer to the station. <laughs> I see. For you. There's a little bit of business about you that your mother also did on television. Take a look at this. And these are the pictures taken of Eric in the hospital. And this is the bill. <laughs> Circumcision, ten dollars. Well, that's cheap enough. <laughs> Eric has promised, uh... <clears throat> it shows you what you can get for ten dollars, is that right? Uh, Don't show us your scar and thank you very much. Well, That's... listen, my mother always said uh, one stripper in the family was enough. <laughs> That's all right. Thanks, Jack. Thank you, Eric, very much. Come on over here. <laughs> and no show and tell either. Now, those in the television control room got a considerably different view of Gypsy than those who watched her at home. It's always that case. Now, here's one of the creators of that Gypsy, Reese, uh, Gypsy Lee, Rose Lee show. Rose, Russ. Rose. Yeah, Rose, Rose. 
Well, the director of countless other Channel 7 productions, good and bad, before he became one of Hollywood's busiest producers and directors, he has a, how many Academy Awards he's done, I don't know Wow, Hardy Pacetta! Has. How many Academy Awards have you now produced for television? Uh, 17, not this year. 17 total. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I missed out on Snow White. He did a little, a little glee, right? Oh, I didn't do this year, so I didn't. <laughs> How did you ever get into doing that? You went from here to San Francisco down to Los Angeles. Down to Los Angeles? Well, uh, I don't know. I got, uh, I did a game show, and uh, from there did Smothers Brothers, and then from there into, uh, I don't know, that. Don't you love know the way these, about this? Uh, the way these guys uh, throw around names? All the Smothers Brothers, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. yeah. Follow up the whole show here. Yes, no, I want to know about Gypsy. <laughs> Gypsy, the most unpredictable, outrageous, crazy, uh, difficult, lovable, and uh, talented lady you could ever find. She'd do anything for a laugh, as you know. And uh, I'll never forget, uh, it wasn't exactly all laughs. We got in the plane. We went to Moscow. We ended up going into Rome at 3 in the morning. She didn't like our hotel. We had to get up and go to the airport and wait until they opened up a gate. And we had to come home. Well. That was not only our only travelings. I mean, if I went into the rest of the stories of that, we'd be here for three hours. But, oh, we haven't uh, got the time on no, you know, that no, is no. tough. But, but no, 30 more seconds about Gypsy, and we were down to the point when she used to come back and forth every week to, from Los Angeles, and she always would have a new breed or a new brood of animals, and she would never leave them home. She just, uh, un unheard of. She would bring them in any way she could. She'd end up getting on the plane, stuffing them into her dress in the front part and her whole dress would be moving around and so forth and the stewardess would come over and she says is there something in your dress alive i mean what are you doing there and she says don't you touch it darling or you're going to hear from me i mean she got away, she got away with it she got away. <laughs> gypsy was, the business was making the dress move around as we call but there was another guy an unforgettable personality here from the bay or maybe the outstanding one ever and he was somebody that you and I both worked with. He oh, had a yeah. chance to become the biggest star in the United States if he wanted to do, and he didn't. And that That's was right. Don Sherwood. Absolutely. You know, this is the guy. I'll be speeding up. better than anybody, Marty, in this business. How would you rank that guy? Well, he, he was he was really a uh, superstar. They never heard of that word in those days, but he really was. That was a cult show. It had a cult following. It uh, it, it had ratings. I mean, people would uh, try to get a ticket, and they had to wait six months to get in to see that show. And it was on. We were on the air live three hours, three and a half hours a night, five nights a week. And it was the biggest thing. Group W is uh, another big company, and they had... Uh, the thoughts of a show for Steve Allen. They came up here and watched the show for three or four nights. They copied that format. And out of that, from Steve Allen, it went to Johnny Carson. It went on and on. We did live commercials in that show. Beer, he'd shake it. It would square. Yeah, he was one of a kind. Yeah, Don Sherwood. Of... Thank you, Marty Pacetta. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Well, Don Sherwood, who was a long-time sufferer from emphysema, died in 1983. But we have with us tonight a fellow I went to high school with. He came in about 40 years after I did. His friend, a straight man, foil and second banana, KFRC's Carter B. Smith. <laughs> Carter. Hi, Carter. Hi, you. Hi. Thank you. Uh, I know upon seeing that tape, you got a lot of things from Don Sherwood, including clothes. I'm, Is that right? Yeah, wearing some of the very similar. Yeah, I, I took everything right. I could take from him. Yeah, you know, why do you he think? Did it right. Why do you think he was so successful over the years? Because he was honest, and he didn't let anybody talk him out of doing what his instincts told him was best. And right. uh, I think that's one of the keys to it. Yeah, in a in an area like this, somebody like that has a very strong personality, but he also was a very self-destructive person, wasn't he? Yeah, he, uh, I think I think you could say that. You know, yeah, without question. Yeah, when you first started working with him in radio, what was your job? I was a newsman. Yeah. And uh, I was told, watch out for this guy because yeah. he's a tough cookie. Yeah. Well, how did you ingratiate yourself with Don? I ingratiated myself. He wasn't easy to get myself. to know. Anyway. No, he wasn't. No, he, he wasn't at all. He was a difficult man to get to know. But uh -huh. uh, they're not turning I, the lights I, out I, on I, you, Carter. I, they just I, they started to fade I, to black. That's well, it. we've been standing here for about a minute now, and yeah. at our age, things start to dim. <laughs> That's right. Uh, the lights, the lights were going out, or, right. or the show was over. Yeah. Thought, Jesus, yeah. two hours really goes fast in modern television. Actually, it's it's Saturday night. The way things are going. Carter, what was your question? Never mind. Forget it. Thank you, Carter, very much. Nice seeing you again. Thank you, Carter. It's an airplane and a Harley Davidson. Carter B. Smith. There you go. Okay. Okay.
Yeah. Turn the yeah. lights on after already. I thought it would run a little longer. That's right. That. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Hey, well, Carter B. Smith uh, was a terrific guy, and he had a chance to get a whole new career started by meeting Don Sherwood, you know? A lot of fact, people. There's no, yeah, there's no way of knowing who's going to actually become stars in TV. In fact, we never have. We've been here for years. Nothing's <laughs> ever happened. Yeah. Well, some of the most unlikely made the great in a, in a great big way, as you're going to see when we come back here on the show tonight. Stay with us. Here we go. <laughs> Congratulations, Channel 7, on 40 years of service to the Bay Area. Presenting the perfect reconciliation between love of family and passion for driving the innovative new BMW 5 Series sedan. This Panasonic Omni Movie camcorder to shoot in daylight. If anyone believes this couple should not be married, let him speak now. <laughs> you might expect this Panasonic camcorder to shoot in room light. Let him speak now. But what you don't expect is that it can shoot by the light of one candle, and it's VHS. Let him speak now. Camcorders that do the unexpected make Panasonic just slightly ahead of our time. I uh, always thought of myself as a pretty independent person until I had a family and I started looking for health insurance. When you're on your own, you find out it's pretty expensive. If, uh, if I worked for a big corporation, they'd take care of my health insurance for me. But I don't think I want to do that. When you need answers, call on Blue Cross. Besides, I don't know if Cowboy's a job description in any corporation. You? <laughs> we care about what's good for you. I've heard so much about country music lately. I mean, it's even the president's favorite music. So, on the way to the car, I thought, what the heck? I'll give country a try. I turned on KSAN 94.9 FM, and guess what? The music gave me a lift. I understood the words. It was a great change of pace. There are five buttons on my car radio. I changed one to 94.9 FM. Discover today's country on KSAN 94.9 FM. Bay Area newspapers. And it proclaimed that tomorrow night is the yep. night KGO TV Channel 7 goes on the air. Startling copy. And here's what we offered for our gala premiere program 40 years ago, Jack. After a greeting from the governor, we had the station blessed by Catholic, Jewish, and Protestant religious leaders. No use taking any chances, no, I folks. I mean, the way things are going, you know. And then there was a World War II documentary, I guess for me, Eisenhower's Crusade in Europe. Yep. That was followed by our first big local live show, and it was right from the stage at the Golden Gate Theater. Yeah, the MC was Gary Moore, and we had a dancing Weird Brothers. You remember the Weird Brothers? Big Weir band Brothers. singer, yeah. LMA Morse. A Latin American dance team, Lolito and Ardo. We all remember them. And Artie James, who did tricks on roller skates. Oh, I remember we missed Artie. that kind of TV. Oh, yeah. TV strong. hadn't developed any real local stars yet. Artie worked all the big rooms, and so the field was wide open for all the local talent who felt that maybe TV stardom was in their future. Now here's one whose first TV appearance was on Channel 7 in 1951, and I won't surprise you to know that he's still going strong. We started KGO, yeah. yeah. Remember the, the columnist, you know, the San Francisco Chronicle Examiner, Joel was laying this muscle guy, we're gonna give him six weeks and he'll be off the air. Happy Monday morning. Hey, they're all my little boys and girls, my helpers. Boys and girls, come here. Did you have a nice weekend? Did you have fun this weekend? Everybody used to beat me up in school. This leaves its mark psychologically, you know, that you don't have a good image of yourself. I hated myself. I hated people. I hated kids because I was sick. I was sick from the sugar. And the minute I quit sugar, everything changed. Just like that. 
Born again. Rigorously training in San Francisco is an Oakland physical culturist, Jack Lalonde. He is out to fulfill a life's ambition to swim the Golden Gate underwater. The laziest organism, the laziest instrument in the whole world is yeah. the human body. Talk to a thousand athletes. Yeah. Ask them if they like to train. Oh, I hate it. what do you do? Good results. This body, the only way you can hurt is don't use it. You have to use this body in the society that we're living in today This, with all the stress and all the artificial foods and colorings and all the things that are putting in the universe. This body yeah. has to be kept to its maximum. maximum. See, this body, if it's exercised and fed properly, then it rises above its environment. That's why physical fitness is going to escalate. It's going to be more popular as the years go by for man to survive. See, it's survival of the fittest. The fit survive, the rest go down the tube. An oxygen tank and heavy weights will keep him 20 feet underwater. I was doing booking Les Malloy's show, appearing on, I was a girl Friday day, they call him co-host. Yeah, right. And I, I did, I booked this show, appeared on the show and ran around doing all these things. And somebody called up one day and said, we have this fellow over in Oakland that can do a thousand push-ups through the whole program. And I thought, oh boy. She so wore a, a translucent leotard. No, no, I, no, I didn't. No, wait, no, the I real didn't. story I, comes no, out. No, I pedal pusher. Sure. Pedal anyway, pedal. <laughs> <laughs> you remember those pedal You pushers? are 109. <laughs> Lalan is buffeted by changing tides, forcing him to swim an additional three quarters of a mile. How's life now? Well, after all these it's years, fantastic. Hey. We travel all over the country, yeah. and we lecture. Uh, he lectures. We travel together. Yeah. A lot of people want us together now. I do yeah. seminars for you know for medical groups. I introduce him, and, 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 uh, and, there you and go. I kind of warm the people up, and then yeah. he gets You're out there. You're a good warmer upper. I can and tell And then he socks it to him, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> after 42 minutes, he finally surfaces. The one-time Mr. America thus becomes the first person in the world ever to swim the Golden Gate underwater. For the muscle man with a bulging bicep, bravo! Doesn't work with us, does it? It's not <laughs> no, that great. Right. You know, in the good old days, an unknown could walk in off the street with any kind of a peculiar idea and really become a great success, right, Jack? <laughs> Why are you looking at me when you have a peculiar idea? We're especially blessed here because some of the most weird, well, wacky, wonderful characters, we always have to call them wonderful after we have call them weird and wacky, right. in television you. have made their home right here at Channel 7. Now, here is perhaps the most unlikely TV star of all. Now, who would think that a small, chubby, balding, middle-aged and raspy-voiced son of a North Beach Sicilian immigrant and an obscure produce wholesaler would become a nationwide TV star? His area of expertise was vegetables, and he had a unique way of pronouncing the word. You know, folks, I like to see eat more of the green leafy vegetables. And yet Joe Carcioni, that vigorous dynamo of vegetables, became the Pied Piper of produce. After a number of years on KCBS Radio and KRON-TV, Joe came to Channel 7 in 1978 and became the top banana in produce, talking to 14 million people on 133 stations throughout the country. Unfortunately, Joe died last August of cancer, and we all miss him. But we will always think of him, and certainly with no disrespect, as residing in a kind of celestial produce market in the sky. Very good. Joe Carcioni, a greengrocer, with your tip for the day. Now this may be the most outrageous of our TV personalities. From his regal throne room in the Channel 7 Tenderloin Studios, Count Marco imperiously dispensed boudoir advice based on his singular decree. It is every woman's unquestioned purpose and duty to serve the men in her life. His reign at Channel 7 ended 25 years ago, and today, Count Marco holds court in Palm Springs, where he is retired, and he's sometimes known as Mark Spinelli. And for contrast, how about Cottonseed Clark? Cottonseed was a genuine cowboy who did well enough on local TV to drive a very large Cadillac sporting a pair of steer horns on the hood. Now it's safe to say that there's no act on today's television that can be compared to Cottonseed's. He recited poetry of his own composition, poetry from the heart. It was amazing how simple and easy it looked. But what was in my mind was when I, like Paul, could have a beard and shave just all the time. Well, Incidentally, that uh, film was shot by Werner Rule, who's an engineer here in 1949. Right. Cottonseed moseyed over to other broadcasting pastures and ended up as a successful owner of a country and western radio station in San Jose. And when he died in his home in Belmont, that was about 10 years ago, the yeah. obituaries listed him as Clark Flock. That was his real name. 
But to early TV fans, he'll always be Cottonseed Clark, the cowboy poet. In the 1950s, up to 50 million people sat enthralled each Sunday night as a newspaper columnist trooped out a string of fire eaters, jugglers, <laughs> spies, you weren't in on that act, <laughs> ventriloquists, and some of the biggest stars of the day. It's a really big show. For 23 years, Ed Sullivan was the most popular and the most powerful host on television. His show mixed sword swallowers with Elvis, roller skating chimpanzees with Albert Schweitzer, and the Beatles with dancing bears. Hey, how about this for an idea? We'll do the same thing on a local level. Now we'll get the star local newspaper columnist, Herb Cain, and we'll call the show Baghdad by the Bay. That's what someone came up with in 1961. And Herb Cain's co-host in Baghdad by the Bay, San Francisco's premier newscaster and commentator, William Winter. William Winter. <laughs> We worked together years ago. That, remember, we worked together in radio years That's ago. That's right. <laughs> Bill was just reminding me, he and I worked together in radio, and I hate to use the date, 1945 and 46, right, Bill? Right. But the thing that I always remember about you, even all times we worked together, everybody was working around for you, you knew, unique way to identify themselves, and you had the most unique sign-on in the world. Give us your sign-on. Right. Well, uh, back in 1935, when I started in radio, everybody had a, a unique sign-on, as you'd say, uh, ladies and gentlemen, hello, or good evening, everyone. So I adopted the salutation, ladies and gentlemen, how do you do? And I used to say that every single day on radio. Remember that? In a previous <laughs> incarnation. Right. And then went on to television. And every year I said, ladies and gentlemen, how do you do? Until one day in 1951, you and I were covering the Japanese peace treaty, you remember? That's right. That's Here right. in San Francisco. And we were busy all day long broadcasting every speech and recording. And by the time I got onto the television studio that evening, I was dog tired. Uh, and I, I couldn't think. <laughs> and I got on the air, and for the first time in all these many years, I said, ladies and gentlemen, how do you know? <laughs> <laughs> there he is, William Winter, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> That's a great story. Thank, Thank you, you Bill, very much. As our party continues, we're going to recall a dramatic moment from a prize-winning drama, and then we'll have some crazy times from some wacky... <laughs> Happy 40th anniversary from all of us at 30 something. We changed this picture to make a point about a legendary beauty. But unless you look close, you'd never see it. That's true of Alaska. Even after the oil spill, the things you come here to see and do are unchanged. From Columbia Glacier to Mount McKinley, the Kenai Peninsula to Ketchikan. Alaska is still home to spectacular fishing, wildlife, and scenery. So come to Alaska this summer and see one of the most beautiful faces on Earth, Alaska. Want to meet the right girl? Yeah, tasteful girl with quality written all over her. I want to connect the dots. Meet the right girl, St. Pauli girl, the full-body German beer with quality and great taste. You're the girl for me. Do you want to meet the right girl? Sure, she's rich. Foreign with a great body. Hello, boys. What a boogie. Meet the right girl, St. Pauli girl, the rich, full-body German beer with great taste. Now that's a great body. <laughs> what makes a long holiday weekend even better? Bruner's Memorial Day sale. Four big days packed with savings on anything you choose at Bruner's. Sofas, recliners, dining sets, carpets and rugs, mattresses, and more. Buy with no payments or finance charges till 1990. And if you pay cash, you can take an additional 5% off the low sale prices. It's the weekend to save during the big Memorial Day sale, now through Monday at Bruner's. There's no other furniture store like it. This credit card gives me an upgrade on Air Antarctica. Now I'm insured for lost luggage in a rickshaw in Rangoon. Whoopee. While other cards offer fluff, consider the substance of Chase, Visa, and MasterCard. Use the Chase cards and double the manufacturer's warranty. Rent with a Chase card for full collision protection at no extra cost. And college-age kids get a free extra card in their name. Skip the fluff. Great. The first scented credit card. Get Chase, Visa, and MasterCard. Real stuff, no fluff. And what was 
life like back in, when TV was new here in San Francisco? Well, for Mary Martin, as you can see here, she was the star of the, one of the biggest hit musicals of all time, South Pacific, but it would be another six years before she could fly onto television as Peter Pan. Yeah, and the Volkswagen Beetle had just been introduced to the United States in that entire year of 1949, only two of them were sold. Only two? Just two. Just television yes. had its first successful sitcom, a transplant from radio called The Goldbergs. TV drama was just getting underway, and through the years it would move in waves of popularity, from cops to comedy, from classics to kids to cowboys. And each generation developed its own favorite cast of fictional characters, and then often followed them faithfully for many seasons. And not all the drama has come from the networks. A dramatized series Channel 7 was especially proud of was called The American West. It was actor Rip Torn and a memorable performance as John Steinbeck that brought the broadcasting industry's most prestigious award to Channel 7 and the American West series. It was an episode called Steinbeck Country, and it won the Peabody Award in 1985. And then the whistle screams again, and the dripping, smelly, tired, wops and Chinamen and Polacks, men and women, they straggle out and droop their ways up the hill into town. Cannery Row becomes itself again, quiet, magical. Mm -hmm. well, two, yeah, it was. It's a wonderful, a wonderful thing. Uh, dramatic programs always seem to walk away with the major awards and the attention of critics. I don't recall a quiz show that's been showered with critical acclaim. Yeah, it's true, but, you know... Or but, us, either. But, yeah, the very beginnings of TV, right up until today, the game shows really have been amongst television's most popular programs. Yeah. have to be. Say the secret word and divide a hundred dollars. <laughs> yes, the $64,000 question. Queen for a day! and master of anniversaries, Al Hemmel! I'm here to play the anniversary game of the Couriers. Three, two, one, yeah! California Countdown. And here's your host, Jim Lane. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hal, and thank you, gang. Hi, gang! The word is chimble. What does that mean, Merle Zellerbeck? Uh, chimble is to nibble or gnaw. What do you say, Paul Spiegel? Chimble is a term of endearment for the girlfriend of a chimney sweep. <laughs> Duncan Wagnall says chimble means to gnaw or nibble. That's why we put Jim on first. And here they are, the panelists from Oh My Word, Miller Zellerbach, John Jula, Tart, Scott B. There you go. Right in here. Right in here. Okay. <laughs> well, Scott, normally we start ladies first, but you're much closer to I am. Let's start with you, Scott. Hi. You, that show that you were doing, uh, I remember seeing it. Oh, my always, word? Yes, a lot of strange words always came up in that no, particular my, show. One of my favorites was Omphalo Skepsis. Oh, it's one of my favorites, too. Yeah. yeah. You know what it means? I have not the vaguest idea. <laughs> well, it means the contemplation of one's navel. <laughs> well, they're all doing that in the audience right now as we speak. <laughs> they're all like, oh, I got one right there. Oh, June, yeah. I understand that you um, were sort of reprimanded for being oh, too yes. racy well, on the program. Well, you see, I got here right? San Francisco, and I'm up here, and of course, it's all terribly sophisticated. Sure. And so uh, I, even though being Lassie's mother, and at that time I was on Lost in Space while we were doing yeah, the show, right. you know, I like to get down and dirty, so uh, I would careful, always try careful, to be too. as uh, just a, c close to the edge of just uh -huh. being... Uh, off color. Racy. But not really. You but went over the edge all the time. Oh, I did. <laughs> and here's a witness anyway, to it. Anyway, so right I got little notices, please. Yeah. Uh, Dave Sachs used to come to me, who was our wonderful producer and creator yeah. and, and director and everything else uh -huh. on the show. And he said, uh, you know, just tone it down a little bit, June. So there it was. I was a bit too racy. Even then. Even then. Well, you look gorgeous <laughs> tonight. Merla, you were uh, attacked by an autograph uh, hunter in the uh, back of a cab or something? Or? No, no, no. no. Okay, no. Right. Scratch that <laughs> Well, in the, sort of in the front of the cab, actually. Oh, it was in the front of the cab, sir. I got that one. It was June and I who were taking, sharing a cab on the way to the station. Uh -huh. And when we got out, the cab driver uh, looked at June kind of strangely, and he said, uh, may I ask you a question? 
And she said, certainly. And he said, are you Peel Lindstrom? <laughs> <laughs> Referring, of course, to Ingrid Bergman's daughter. Right. And yeah. June flashed her big smile. <laughs> she said, no, I'm June Lockhart. And he said, well, if you're going in there, lady, could you get me Peel Lindstrom? <laughs> <laughs> That's the price of fame. Thank oh, you yeah. all very much for being here, Scott. Thank you, Jack. Good seeing you. It's a pleasure, June. Thank you, Thank you for toning it down for us. That was real nice. I appreciate that. <laughs> Just come right over here if you want to do it. Right, right. Now, while we're still on the game show thing, I have a question for you, okay? The question for you is movie host. Yes. What glamorous Oklahoma blonde gave away flowers and free dinners and television, and she just sold the pet house on Knob Hill? That could only be one person the host for the prize movie, three, Pat Montandine. Pat Montandine. Three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. Don't you hate to exercise? I just hate it. And now, here's Pat Montanai, <laughs> sooner or later. <laughs> okay, now, when you still were... Still just hating exercise. <laughs> That's right, still doing that. I saw you back there lifting legs yeah, and doing oh, stuff like hard. that. It's very hard. It's hard when you were in now. charge of the prize movie, uh, what kinds of questions do people always ask you? Uh, they always ask me about the people I worked for. Mm -hmm. And I had some very terrible stories to tell them. You did? Yes. You told them the truth. I told them the truth. And I'm sitting by Dave Sachs tonight, and I'm, it's a wonder I'm even out here. Yeah. Because he hired me. And uh, one day I called in to the studio, and I said, uh, I really don't feel well today. I'm sick. And I talked to Gordon Waldier and David Sachs. And they said, you get your in here. When that camera goes on, you've got to be there. OK. So I walked into the studio with my bathrobe, a pillow, a blanket, and a thermometer. Yes. And, and the yeah. camera came on, yeah. and I'm lying on the sofa I had on the set, and I had the thermometer in my mouth, and I turned to the camera and I said, 102, and they're making me work today. <laughs> and what, what kind of response did you get from the audience? Well, well, not from the audience called in, yeah. because they made me continue to work. But David Sachs and Gordon Waldier came in and they went, into the studio and they said you sit up there and you act like you know what you're doing and that you feel well i said yes sir so i sat up and the camera came to me the next time and i said i'm still sick but they're making me act like i feel well <laughs> well that doesn't sound like dirty no, no. rotten old dave Sachs to me at all no no no, no that's right wouldn't do that. yeah. but you they came out with, you came out with a blasphemous statement right. one day particularly in these times you made one statement on your show that was what well i, I made a lot <laughs> <laughs> about exercise Oh, about exercise. I don't think anyone should ever exercise. It's lazy lady stuff. Okay, and that's it. We're that's it. <laughs> All those people out there have been working out. Here's a question for you. Now, what person was most well known for a dog and a helicopter and used to host movies? Do you remember their names? A dog and a helicopter. Yes, and a man and a, who, movie. And a man who had it, right. Best known. Lou That's Hurley. close enough. Lou Hurley. Of That's course. right. Lou Hurley. Whew, I'm really glad you got that. I don't know where we would go if you didn't get that particular answer. Lou Hurley. Louie, how are you? Doesn't it? There must body after all these years. Every time someone wants to do, introduce you about the past, they talk about you being with a dog. Yeah. You know, they always said. Early on showbiz, never go on with an animal act. Dumb old Louie, I did it. They don't remember me. They Who's in charge me. of the act, Lou? I mean, uh, seriously. My ex-wife. <laughs> <laughs> she got Myrtle in the custody battle. That's right. And seriously. we had to go pick up the dog every Saturday, Saturday put night. the dog on the show, and bring the dog back in custody. Right. Right. That's yes. a true story. It i got to ask you a question, though, that refers to what you do now. How many hours have you, Dumbo, <laughs> <laughs> spent in a helicopter over the Bay Area? About 23,000. And... This July be 26 years I've been doing the thing for Kid Yo Radio. 23,000 hours flying around in a helicopter. And it looks like you're going to keep doing it for Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't plan on retiring. Oh, well, you never could. Because huh. you're always very cheap. I dying. need the you money. the money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. We'll try to get the dog custody back to you. Lou Hurley. That's... Thank you. Bye-bye, Lou. Thank Bye. you very much. Thank you. <laughs>
Well, in the 60s, having a dog as a co-host for movies was very avant-garde. But today, yes, today, there are some independent stations that consider it to be an innovation. Don't get bitter, <laughs> Russ. Not but the maybe time there aren't any it. completely new ideas on TV anyway. Jack, but we'll see them, some of them. We take a look at the early day. Don't early get bitter. Shows. Don't no, get bitter. Bitter. <laughs> but dogs, they steal a dog, I think. Channel 7 has been bringing the Bay Area great entertainment for 40 years. Congratulations to Channel 7 from all of us at Entertainment Tonight. BMW dealer nearest you, call 1-800-3344-BMW. You are not going to believe this place. You okay, dear? You'll find the land of sky blue waters in every hands. Hands so refreshing. Register to win an Alaskan fishing trip and prizes from Dai Wai and Igloo. Sweepstakes details at participating stores where hams is sold. Danny's. What to Danny's? It's a splendid place for kids to dine. Kids can feel at home there. And their food is really so divine. Danny's. What a truly perfect treat. Danny's. Where it's such a joy to eat. Any, tinny, tinny. Denny's proudly offers our plate collection featuring the Flintstones. Three different plates, $1.49 each. I gotta tell you, when this issue of TV Guide hit the stand, Sherman Clay was advertising a Philco radio television phonograph combination. And it was only $627.50. Well, listen to its features, and I'm going to quote here. A 10-inch TV screen, 28 tubes, five rectifiers, whatever they are, AM, FM radio, a two-speed phonograph that plays both standard 78 RPM records and yes. the new long-playing 33 RPMs. How about that, <laughs> I'd like to have some of those today. <laughs> TV Guy was a pretty thin publication in those days, but by 1950, KRON had joined KPIX and KGO. But the three San Francisco TV stations did not go on the air until the middle of the afternoon. We don't wake up till the middle of the afternoon. <laughs> yeah? right. And by 9 or 10 at night, they were signing off. What's more, all the stations took a day or two off every week. Yeah, and even Hard after we had started broadcasting yeah. on seven days a week, it was a while before anyone saw the value of starting early or even staying up late. Yeah. But by 1961, we were not only running late night movies on Channel 7, there was a guy who was waking us up at 7 a.m. We never forgave him. Here he is, that early morning host, El Jasbo Collins! Jasbo! <laughs> My man! <laughs> yeah. Al Collins. Al, you shouldn't have dressed, you know? <laughs> and he's out of tune, right? <laughs> Russ, oh, how how you fine, you just great. I can never, knowing you as I did, you were an all-night guy, you were up swinging, you love jazz, and you're an expert at it. How did a guy like you ever decide he could get up that early in the morning and do some work? I wanted to do television at that time, and we had an opportunity for an hour and a half every day from 7 to 8.30. And we used to circle the town all day long looking for strange-looking characters and tell them to be here at 7 o'clock in the morning and be ready to go on the air. Even and one of them lent you that hat. That's right. This <laughs> was the original hat that I wore in 1960, 
and a lot of people don't recognize me without it. <laughs> so that's why I'm here. I don't know why not. Gee, Al. What about, how did you enjoy those days? What well, that, was, uh, that program was uh, a real workshop. No, exp no uh, rehearsal, no nothing. Marty Pacetta was up in the control room there. In spite of that, did it go all right? Yeah, it went all right. <laughs> sure did. And uh, we had a lot of people coming on that show from all over. We had a, a Maharaja from India, and uh, he, uh, he was sitting there, and the people from the State Department were there, and they were wondering whether he was going to be in any trouble or not. <laughs> and by the, they went out and looked to check the doors for security. And when they came back, I had a sombrero on his head, a pistol in his hand, and, and he was, he was saying, I don't got to show you no stinking badge. <laughs> Welcome. All right, you guys. Hey, Jack. Good Thanks very much for coming in here. Well, in 1964 and 65, Channel 7 experimented with a number of different early morning programs. In the April of 1966, the idea came together with just the right kind of people. The result was the longest-running show on San Francisco television. Good morning. Yes, it's A.M., all right. And uh, this is Jim Dunbar with Nancy Ann Fleming and Gary Bentley. A.M. is a good thing to call a show like this, uh, seeing as how uh, it makes sense when you consider that we're on 6.30 in the morning. We've got lots of things coming up here on A.M. this morning, lots of things that you'll like to see, and we're looking forward to them, too, right here on A.M. Is that a sweet voice or not? The AM show became AM San Francisco most recently. Good morning, Bay Area. There have been a number of hosts and co-hosts during the last 23 years. At one time, I was fortunate enough to be one of them. The very first were Nancy Fleming and Jim Dunbar. Hey, Joe! There you go. Okay. Now, Jim. Can I stay up here? No, you can't. I have to join you to stay right here. <laughs> well, now, I'll take turns. Jim, uh, I know you like to work by yourself mostly. Yes, Jack. What did you feel Just when Nancy. Just give me Nancy... that microphone and I'll yeah, yeah. take it. <laughs> How did you feel when Nancy uh, joined you in the morning? Oh, I felt uh, impinged upon, uh, and cornered, <laughs> and uh, trapped. trapped. <laughs> All yeah. those kinds of things, I know. But you, the both of you, set the style, and you, Jim, on that show for so many years for a form that's going on and on and on. Don't we look like pioneers? No, that's right. It's a little wagon well, you showed up in, you know. Maybe one half the act looks like yeah, a pioneer. that's right. Did you ever have any trouble after all that time of getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning, whatever time it was? Oh, I, I learned years and years ago that, uh, you know, if that's, the, if that's the trick you pull, and if you want to continue making the mortgage payments... Uh, that's what you do. You defy you gravity do. every morning and put your feet on the You ground. know, I also remember you did an interview with lots of very famous and well-known... I remember the interview you did with Robert Kennedy, for example. I mean, you must yes. have had some real memorable moments in that show. I don't think I can tell him in a minute, though. Um, no, no, you can't. Kennedy once... Uh, uh, Senator Kennedy uh, told me, or there are people told me, that we could ask any question except a political question. And I said, is it okay if I try to get one by you? And he said, sure, go ahead. But, uh, you know, it's, it better be pretty good. So, and this had better be pretty good if I can remember the first <laughs> I, So I said, how come in your book, Senator Kennedy, you don't talk about politics? And he dug me in the ribs and he said, is that your best shot? And I said, yeah. He said, I'm not going to comment on it. Oh, <laughs> said, I'm going to leave this to you right Goodbye. now. Goodbye. <laughs> well, I remember a lot of good times. I think that I was in school at Berkeley during the, the year that we were doing she the show She was 14 together. when she started yes, doing this course. program. And I was learning a lot there, but I learned more from being with you. I really oh, enjoyed sure. it. It was wonderful. And uh, I left the show to have a baby, and you left the show to, to anchor the baby. news. <laughs> and probably to have a baby as well. It and felt Bob, like it. It did. Yes. Bob Marshall took over the show for a year, and he liked to make phone calls all around the country. Now, not all of those conversations were terribly enlightening. And our first feature on the program uh, for a Friday would be a chat with Floyd Lee in Spivey's Corner, North Carolina. Mr. Lee, are you there? Yes, sir. How are you, Floyd? All right. This is Bob Marshall in San Francisco. Who? <laughs> Okay, we're ready if you're ready, Floyd. Yeah, I thought that was fairly dignified, actually, <laughs> compared with some of the things that went on. It was a strange period because Jim had left the show. The show was going to be replaced in the next year by Good Morning America, which was taking that time period, and AM would then sort of be transformed to a little more structured 
um, program. At this time, it was unstructured playtime, and we had a great production crew. We had Howard Harden directing and, and Linda Goggle, right. Agar Jakes. And these were people who loved to throw it against the wall and see what it did to the plaster, you know. And there that must have been somebody you got through to on, the, on a phone call that you thought, like, how did I? How did this ever work? How did I ever reach this person? Who no, I wish th I wish that could have happened, but I don't <laughs> think it did. The but ones that I wanted to did. get through to and couldn't get through to. Yeah. Remember those? We had a number of uh, issues and newsmakers, but I I remember most of the fun things that we did. Well, I remember and, having fun when you were the host of the show and I was auditioning, and you were very kind, and I still appreciate it. Bob. You got the job, Thanks. and there I went. <laughs> That's Thank the way you. it goes. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Bye. Good to see you. Now, Jim Lang and I also did the show together. In fact, that's where we met. And Jim ran into a guy who wanted his job. And I will always remember Jim's gallant reply. Welcome back to AM San Francisco. And it's a pleasure to have with us today a gentleman who's going to show you how to improve your kitchen habits and make life around the kitchen a lot easier by simply applying the science of physics. Professor Miller. Professor, welcome to AM San Francisco. Yeah. This lovely doing? lady is Nancy Fleming. Professor. Why can't I have a job? The like of which you have, surrounded by good-looking girls all the time. Well, I'm only surrounded by one good But let girl. us not go into that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you love that hair? Oh. I was going to say, what happened? Oh, man. what happened to our hair? We both had a lot more of it, I think we? we look a lot better now. And, that's, uh, and you look gorgeous tonight. No one has said that yet. Actually, a lot of people have said that, Jim, but that's all right. I'll I'm the only... I'm the... Right. <laughs> I'm the only one who saw it happen, though. <laughs> you, you knew it wasn't an easy process. <laughs> oh, you look lovely. Now, doing the show with you was great, and the thing I remember the most, it was a short period of time, we took tap dancing yes, lessons. Yes, does shuffle ball change mean anything to you? I, it does, it's, it, but it does Sort of like singing, right? Y yes, I, I'm very good. I have no rhythm, and I can't sing. But I had a pair of tap shoes that were size 12 and a half with sparkles on them, and they were stolen. So if you see anybody on the street... With these shoes, uh, arrest them. They're they, mine. They'd be hard to miss. Why don't you go look for your shoes now? See okay. you later. Thank Thanks. you, Don. See you later. <laughs> you know, in addition to having his own show, Albert Wilson was a frequent guest on AM. We always enjoyed him. He was a gardening wizard best known for his self-effacing modesty. If some questions were unanswered, they're right here in the book by Albert Wilson, How Does Your Garden Grow? It's an awfully good book. You can get it at Macy's or uh, you can get it at the Emporium. And it answers all the questions that beautifully written, I wrote it. <laughs> Thank you. I recognize that voice. Did yeah. we sell a lot of books for you, Albert? Yes, indeed. We did sell a lot of books. This is a beautiful rose. Now, that rose was on the first show uh, that I appeared, How Does Your Garden Grow? And it's peace. It was right after the war, you know. And so I thought that should be in my first show. But I had uh, many guests. Uh, I was re instructed to be sure and have some guests. And one day, the Begonia Society asked if I could uh, have them as uh, our guests, and I did arrange. And so Sunday comes, and I brought no flowers at all. And uh, 9.30, uh, quarter to 10, and they didn't show up. And so I went outside, and I picked up from the estate some dirty old weeds. I was going to say, and, you had uh, a little trouble there. Yes, uh, your garden wasn't got, growing so like well that. that day. And pretty soon they came in. Pretty soon they came in, and uh, this wonderful lady, and uh, oh, my gosh, I forgot the begonia, says the fellow. And he said, I only live down the hill here, and I'll get them. And so off he goes, and so I gave a magnificent talk on weeds, and they all commented about that, and after 15 minutes, why, he shows up with a magnificent display of begonias. I moved to the side, and I, intro I introduced this woman, and I said she was president of the Begonia Society, and she'd written books and all that. She said, Mr. Wilson, I never wrote a book in my life, and I'm president of the society, and that ended that. Well, do you want to know something? You really started something, because yes. all the design shops use these weeds yeah. today. Good to see you again. Thank you, Robert. A man who makes his living with dirt. I always exactly. like, I like that. Exactly. Yes. Dig right in there. Yeah. Well, you know, one of our most prominent uh, AM alumni is Maury Povich. He's a man just who, one. Well, just one, one of the many, a man who's never in awe of a famous guest, and he was also most willing to tell a master storytelling a few stories of his own, as you'll see. We have a story. 1976, the summer, I am stuck in Kansas City. Now, to be stuck in Kansas City in the summertime is one thing. I was covering the Republican National Convention. Now, what possibly could happen to enthrall me during what was supposed to be a dull convention? A book called American Fried, written by Calvin Trillin, 
sh said that the best place to go in Kansas City for ribs was a place called Arthur Bryant's, and that's where I covered the Republican National Convention Fund <laughs> in the week of August of 1976. Well, Nancy... Here we are again. I had a good time working with you in that show. Had all those a years. wonderful time. We yeah. met a lot of great people. Yeah. Um, just, I mean, the I met endless. a couple of nice people. You met, a, yes, and yeah. I remember one in particular yes. that you particularly enjoyed. She's a good friend of mine, yes. It plays where you play in your boat, car, home. It's everything you want to hear, and it changes to the flip of the finger. Oh, I didn't realize how embarrassing that was to see that play. You had such talented acting fingers. Really? If I had known at that point how far you would have gone, it would have been amazing. Just, you, if, well, how'd you, you do that attention. again? How'd you do that? Let's you see if you can still do that. See? see if we can recreate that. I mean, I can that. recreate it. I can dye my hair black, right? Yeah, you were a little darker. Yeah, you noticed that. So and you I. pointed it out. <laughs> <laughs> Point everything Women out to are me, right? always they kind are, to you, You were my they, married Jack? person for a long time. Oh. Did you mention you were married to Jim Lang on the air? No. Well, we just mentioned it there. That's, what, that's why he it's, didn't know. Everyone a, had told you you were so beautiful. It's mentioned right? now. It's <laughs> September of 1982. It was decided to change the show again. So AM San Francisco got a new set of hosts. And for the first time, a studio audience. Take a look. Thanks, so. <laughs> Good morning. Hey, welcome to AM. Uh, this is something that I <clears throat> normally wear, and this is something that Terry decided is normally wear. No, no, I'm, I'm dressed this way for a specific reason. I'm going to do a little dancing, fame style. Fred, this is for you. Oh. Oh. You know, uh, Fred Lacoste, Terry Lowry, of course, you uh, know. You know, I've watched your show many, many times, and the thing is that you always got a genuine gleam in your eye when some handsome young gigolo, I don't want to call that man a gigolo, but whoever that man was, uh, you dance with him or something. You seem to enjoy that. I did. I was trying to make Fred jealous. And did that Never succeed? worked. Never worked. Wait a minute. She's asleep till noon every day anyway. She, <laughs> I, you, she was acting all the way. Yeah. She's not, you're not your basic morning person, Jack. Yeah. Now, the two of you, I read a long article in one of the magazines about how the two of you... Uh, exercise at 3 o'clock in the morning, got up, got <laughs> no. prepared, you prepared coffee for Fred. No, it was a, you got no, it all no. wrong. Well, no. just he right exercises, here. he prepares the coffee, and yeah. he drags me out of bed. That's I how see. it works. So <laughs> Fred does all the work, is that yeah. it? We are married, by the way, yeah. you know, in case there are some folks who don't so, realize doubt it. For what? Yes. <laughs> I don't think anyone in here was shocked right away by I, hearing you say that. Mm. Yeah. We mess around a little, too. <laughs> <laughs> when you were doing that show, you went to Marine World and Marine Land and all those various kinds of places. Oh, Do you yeah. remember any one animal or any one thing that really struck you? Oh, as the camel. The camel the cam was, oh, well, No marvelous. camel stories, Fred, no, I'm no, sorry. No, no, we don't want to go into those. We have a no. seven-second delay, I hope. That's right, yeah, that no camel stories. I did, though, take a great big towel and wipe off the boots of a lot of the women in the front row, I must admit, thanks to the camel. Well, thank you, Fred, very much, and thank you Terry, it's a pleasure to have Good you here again. That's it, huh, Jack? That's it, Fred. There minute? you go. Okay. That's your minute Thanks and five lot, minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And, of course, good morning. Bay Area continues today with Susan Sakura and Don Sanchez. And we'll continue tonight with some of the shows that everyone under 40 grew up with. We'll have crazy fads and wild fads, oddball events mm -hmm. that you saw on your TV. And all during the 40 magic year. You betcha. 40 magic year. Congratulations, Channel 7, on 40 years of service to the Bay Area. that blonde. Telesis. <laughs> it means progress intelligently planned. Tell Aunt Kathy what you got for your birthday. This oh, is a story of Telesis. Lucky girl. Look, she thinks I'm right there. She knows you're a tall Hi, it's me. Yeah. Is Eric there? Hi, Dad. Hey, the uniform looks great, pal. You nervous? A little. By the 21st century, a child will see for a thousand miles. I'm really proud of you. Thanks, Dad. Because the same telephone lines that carry thousands of voices could also deliver pictures worth a thousand words. Life-size and lifelike. It's just one of the things the Pacific Telesis Group is working on today to get you ready for tomorrow. Oh, be quiet, because Grandpa's got something to say. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. Yes, it's just a telephone now. But the 21st century is only 11 years away. Saturday, Emporium Capwell lets you decide what to save on. 
Clip the coupons from your paper for special savings. Cut the wild cards and cut regular prices throughout the store. It's a wild idea. Saving so hot on the things we got. Deal yourself in at Emporium Capwell. In a den high in Montana's Blackfeet country, a grizzly settles for a long winter's nap. Unaware that down below, people with motors and machinery will explore for oil through deep winter. But before she wakes, the people will be gone. The explored land will be replanted so it will soon look as if no one had ever been there. Do people sometimes work through the winter so nature can have spring all to herself? People do. We've always heard that this was a medium of miracles, and Russ just got a note to prove it. Well, you want to be excited and see how great television is. This is a note that said, Cottonseed Clark, that we had deceased a little bit earlier in the show. I was wrong again, as I have been in my life. He is alive and well. He lives in Van Nuys. He tuned the, turned the st station on tonight and saw it. He turned 80 years old on April 12th. Let's hear it for Cottonseed. For Cottonseed. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, by the time KGO TV was a year and a half old in December 1950, television was getting some very powerful kinds of attractions. Science in Action, a show I had worked on once years ago. Uh, Channel 7 that week, they showed scientists actually producing penicillin and some people having a need for it. Channel 5 was broadcasting the big game. Paul Whiteman had a musical review on KGO TV. Arthur Godfrey's talent scouts were on KPIX. And so was a quiz game called Watch and Win. In Science and Action, brain tested me well. That's well. right. And Channel 4, well. there was a suspense drama they had called The Clock. And singing hostess Roberta Quinlan was in the Mohawk showroom at that time. And right here on Channel 7, this guy, Les Malloy, spent Sunday afternoon with entertainers from all the city's nightclubs. And of course, when the kids saw these characters, they all knew what time it was. Say, kids, what time is it? <laughs> Oh, boy, oh, boy, kids, look at those purple marbles pour out of the waffle blanks. These were the gentler, more whimsical television playmates. Some were big network stars. Others were the more modest local celebrities. But to the kids, they were and still are pure magic. Every TV station large enough to hold a puppet stage had its own cast of these characters. Here are some of ours and the people behind them. Okay, let's bring out Dave Garrison, Steve Scott, Nancy Best, and Pat McCormick right now. Oh, yeah. oh, that was great seeing yeah. all those old shows again. You I, said it, Pat. Yeah, I'm Pat McCormick, and I was the guy beneath the uh, the Charlie and Humphrey show that started here on KGO in the early 1960s. That's right. right. Uh, Charlie and Humphrey couldn't make it tonight? No, no, Friday night is league night at the Pacific Bowl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> dog trips over his long white beard aiming for the gutter yeah. but uh, the boys wanted me to thank all of you kids who watched us over the years so peeky boo thanks for watching <laughs> hey hey dudley what's that you Benjamin? know we should thank all the kids who watched dudley's diner back in the 70s no i don't think i can do that well you're still shy no no the one kid that watched our show moved away oh. solid dad i think <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, we do have Mr. Doobie and Miss Nancy from KGO's original broadcast of the Author Room. And Mr. Doobie wants to say hi to all of our friends at home, and he wants to say that he's happy you remembered all of his lessons and turned into such great big doobies. <laughs> <laughs> and so from all of your KGO children hosts who have had fun with us over the past 40 years, thanks, thanks for watching. watching. Yay! Yay! Okay. Yeah. Uh, Steve, it's nice to see you. And you know, every time I look at you, your puppet keeps staring at me. I have to avert my eyes. There's something about that. And he's wearing two microphones. You're not wearing any. It shows you where you stand in the business, Steve. He's the ventriloquist. <laughs> I know that. It's uh, terrific to see that because all the children at home, and I love it. What do you call them? A great big grown-up doobie? Doobie. Big great big doobies. I, that's a whole new thing for you, Jim Lang, to use on your next game show. Yeah, right. Thank you. Was a doobie. And Pat McCormick, I remember when you were doing the show here, you were looking for a writer. Mm -hmm. And you were talking to me about writing some material. But you wanted money. I wanted, I wanted, I wanted American dollars, not those pesos you kept trying to pass off on me. Sorry about that. It was a great that. show. It was a wonderful thing. Now, you, Dave, have yes. a story about something that happened 
on the show. On Dudley yes, Time, we brought right? along a little clip. You know, uh, one of the regular bits on the show was blowing the puppets up. It was sick. It was What's sick. This, what kind of a show we, was that? We had a we had a stage manager named Bob Dick and who got carried away one day. He put a little bit too much gunpowder. Uh huh. In, uh, and this is what happened. This is what happened. Oh yeah. Call me Danger, James Danger. <laughs> Was I dreaming again, or did I just hear a house explode? The house of Dr. Careless is no more. Uh, and Dr. Careless? Dr. Careless is no more. He was a victim of the very carelessness with which he threatened the world. Too bad, too. He seemed like a nice guy. He was a jerk. <laughs> we just about blew up KGL yeah. that day. You don't, you don't get drama like that anymore. No, no. Would you say like to say goodbye to all the grown-up doobies out I there? I would, because I missed a lot of you every time I see the <laughs> big doobies now coming up to me, the, the little ones. I'm sorry. Yeah. I see you now. <laughs> Albert Wilson wants to run over and join you with his flowers any minute. Thank you all very much for being here. Thank Perfect. you very much. And uh, get a new voice. Nice. Well, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> Here's another face that was familiar to kids of the 1960s from the popular children's program, Judy and the Boys. All growing up now, Judy Patterson. Judy? Hey, Judy. All right. Hey, Judy. Tell me about the show you were doing. Well, we started out with Charlie and Humphrey, which I'm sure everybody remembers. Mm -hmm. And then eventually the show became Judy and the Boys, the boys still being Charlie and yeah. Humphrey. Uh -huh. And then we went to Judy at Santa's Village. Now, did you have children on the show, or were you just... No, we didn't. Yeah. We worked, Pat and I worked with Charlie and Humphrey, um, mm -hmm. and it was more of a creative show mm -hmm. than we're, we were seeing before. We were working in small groups, and we had stories that we were telling, and we were involving the children. Our male response was incredible. Did you find show. yourself talking more to Pat or to the puppets? I never talked to Pat. <laughs> That's right. Never only... talked to Pat. We talked to Charlie and Humphrey. We yeah. were the friends. Yeah. Well, thank you, Judy, very much for being here. It's a pleasure to have you, and you're going to stay for the party afterwards. Thank you, Judy Patterson. There was another kids' show that began right here at KGO. It spread nationwide, ultimately became a cult favorite of college students. I'm smiling because I know what's coming. Cult favorite of college students and adults, but most of its fans have never met the people behind these famous characters. Hello. Rex, what's the matter? That, that sweatstone whiplash, my cruel keeper. By golly, let's go into town today and say hello. Not a bad idea. <laughs> That's right. The Colonel isn't with us anymore. I'm in charge now. <laughs> okay, this... This proves you have to be versatile to keep working in this business. If that voice of villainous whetstone whiplash sounds vaguely familiar, you need look no further than... Here I'm it is! I'm going to kill you, <laughs> you rabbit vermin. <laughs> rabbit vermin? <laughs> Rabbit vermin. Rabbit vermin. That's a little oh, thing that gets on the oh, yes. rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> well, it somehow whiplash was always defeated by Crusader and always worked out nice. And the voice behind the rabbit is here tonight. Here she is, Lucille Bliss. <laughs> Lucille, that's wonderful. Hey, Snively, you look terrific. But I'm going to tell Rags you came here. It's kind of scary. I'm not going to do any more hokey voices tonight. I have enough trouble with news now. You oh. know. Lucille tells Now, you were also in Disney. You did one of the Wicked Witches. No, I you? did the Wicked Stepsister. Oh, I did Cinderella's sister Anastasia, her Wicked Stepsister. Oh, yeah, Grace. Oh, I'd love to dance. Cinderella. I knew a girl like that in Brooklyn, as I remember. Really? She's How about she came you, from. <laughs> you are doing a new show now, which is a big hit show, right? Yes. I'm doing the Smur I've been doing Smurfette in the Smurfs, and we're looking forward to a big season. How long have you been doing this now? Thank God, our ninth year. You were just a kid when we did Crusader Rabbit. Oh, yeah. Remember when we got $5 a week? <laughs> and you and I wondered who's going to take the money home? That's one of the reasons then, I haven't retired this year. <laughs> and then it went to 30 Well, you look wonderful, Lucy. Well, thank you. Remember the Happy Birthday show? Oh, I got to tell you, she did a lot of good things in television. She had one of the worst kid shows I've ever seen in my life. Now, you got to you gotta look. Here's the happy birthday show. You judge it. Oh. They're all dressed up in their death costumes, and they're going to do their dances for us tonight. And here they are, the youngsters. There's Dennis and Peggy Pippin and Mary Casasa and Nancy Lindley and Judith Moore. And we're just going to switch over there and see them do their little Dutch dance. Thank you. 
What Lucille didn't know was the children in the next studio couldn't hear the music. I'm sorry about our entertainment. We'll see what we can do about it in a week or so. And I want to get some birthdays. <laughs> Let's hear it, Lucille Bliss. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Jack, how are you? And here right now with the help of Bill Sachs and his great band, here are some moments you may remember and perhaps a few you'd like to forget, like Sorry. that one no, from I 40 that. Magic Years. Bill, go. out listening to the Beatles. Later on, it was Crosby, Stills and Nash, the Eagles. Maybe it's the harmonies, or maybe it's the words. The best music today is on the country station, KSAN 94.9 FM. Country music is music you can understand. It's a great change of pace. I'm glad I tried KSAN, and maybe you should too. Hey, you don't have to be country to like country. Discover today's country on KSAN 94.9 FM. You'd expect this Panasonic Omni Movie camcorder to shoot in daylight. If anyone believes this couple should not be married, let him speak now. You might expect this Panasonic camcorder to shoot in room light. Let him speak now. But what you don't expect is that it can shoot by the light of one candle. And it's VHS. Let him speak now. Camcorders that do the unexpected make Panasonic just slightly ahead of our time. Oh, right there, my man. Okay. How's it going? Perkin. Here's To keep California cooking, we need an enormous amount of energy. But because PG&E has developed so many kinds of energy in such abundance, it's always there when you need it. <laughs> Surprise! Happy birthday! Happy birthday, honey. Oh, my. PG&E, at your service. My, my, my. Yeah, 40 years ago when KGO TV was brand new, you didn't come to television to find out what was happening in the world. That was kind of the job of your daily newspaper. And here in San Francisco, we had four of them. We had the Call Bulletin, the San Francisco News every afternoon, and we had the Chronicle and the Examiner every morning, and there were also two, two dailies were over there in Oakland. Mm -hmm. And the hottest story of the day was the marriage of love goddess Rita Hayworth to one of the world's richest men, Ali Khan. Missed you that time, Russ. Yeah. It was a local angle. The bride had once been a dancer in the chorus at Bimbo's in San Francisco, back when her name was Rita Casino. God knows I tried it. That's right. You inside, always tried. There was a story that sounds familiar. Downtown merchants, can you yeah. imagine? We're complaining just because the city wanted to tear up Market Street again. Can't believe that. Can't and believe, on the huh? financial pages, you can read about America's new minimum wage. It had just been boosted from 40 cents to 70 cents an hour. Now, let me, I want to quote from a newspaper item that appeared in the Examiner, and this was on the day before Channel 7 went on the air. Here it is. KJO TV has plans for news coverage, but they are delaying the inauguration pending completion of studies. Does that sound familiar? Sounds very familiar. On yeah. the best formula for reporting the news and television. <laughs> We're still working on it, right? Is that it? <laughs> but the man who really came up with the formula for presenting news on television, again, here he is, my buddy, William Winner. Thank <laughs> you. 
This guy's not only a great newsman, he had great courage, because he used to sit there every night and do his news reading it like in the old days in radio, and he had to come up with a bright, new, intelligent, creative way of presenting it visually. Tell him what you did, Bill. A creative way. We had a map, and the map was on a beaver board, and the beaver board was on <laughs> an easel right behind me. Funny thing happened during the Korean War. I had a map of Korea on a beaver board on an easel right behind me. And while I was sitting there looking into the camera doing the news report, uh, one of the floor men walked behind the easel and he accidentally pushed the thing and it hit me on top of the head, <laughs> on, the, on the top of the table. I didn't know what happened. I was stunned, really out. When I came to, I noticed there was this map on my head. So I looked into the camera and I said, Korea has fallen. <laughs> I wasn't trying to be clever, you know. She let me get you out. Korea has fallen. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bill, you've also given us a great way to shut Pete Wilson up. We might try that in the future. <laughs> Bill, thanks again. But Thank you, this guy, William Winner, was just one of a whole group of former Channel 7 News alumni. They got together for a family reunion. It was about three weeks ago. And it was exciting as heck for me. It took place during our newscast on May 5th. And for those of you who might have missed it, here are just some of the highlights at that time. San Francisco, Evening Tannehill. Back in those days, we went out and shot the story on film. The film then had to be processed and edited before it went on the air. The bail was denied. Bail denied Patricia Hearst. Oh, I think she's one of the best. I really like Karna Small. She's very good. <laughs> oh, this is terrible. It's like looking into the rearview mirror of life now. <laughs> oh, come on. I don't think you've changed a bit. I don't think you're going to like this story. It's about lending institutions that won't lend money for housing in certain areas. It's called redlining. It was a San Francisco-bound train where the fire broke out. About 40 people aboard when it caught fire. What I want to know is who did our hair? <laughs> <laughs> Are those the two worst-looking people you ever saw? You would like to think that as you were younger, at least you were better looking. At That's least. Our... And sometimes California's new shared custody law makes it tougher on both parents. Good evening, San Francisco. This is Ken Matz, live by satellite from WMAR-TV Channel 2 in Baltimore, Maryland. The elevators would shut down. People would have to go out through the stairway. Hey, I uh, don't look as good as you do. <laughs> well, <laughs> Let me tell you, except for that silver hair. The chances could be as high as 50-50 that your next accident is going to be with an uninsured motorist. I can't believe it. It's I hear myself. <laughs> you, you look terrific, by the way. And, and a new mother, we're told, and everything. Lyndall, you yes. thank you very much. Harry Fuller one time sent me out to do a story in San Francisco on the birth of a two-headed goat at the San Francisco Zoo. <laughs> do you think I've come far doing a current affair? Good morning. I'm Valerie Dickerson, sitting in for Jim Corcoran. That fight over control of the college newspaper isn't over yet. I look like... One of the Supremes, and I sounded like Minnie Mouse. <laughs> Adding children disrupts well-established patterns of living, okay, adds new I burdens, requires new sacrifices. I do want to take the opportunity to say hi to all my old friends at KGO TV and hi to everybody who's listening and watching right now. I told you there was this guy in San Jose. <laughs> you are right, indeed. Wheaties and ketchup? No, no never, never tried Possibly. that. But Wheaties, of course, is the breakfast, breakfast of champions. Everybody knows that. This person is one of the pioneers of television, and he is with us right now. William Winter, who began broadcasting here on Channel 7 in 1958. Well, the station management wondered whether uh, television was really equipped to broadcast news because a person would just sit behind a desk and look into the camera and talk. Roger Grimsby at 7, weeknights on Channel 7. Good evening, I'm Roger Grimsby. Here now the news. I lasted this long. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday, KGO TV, and thank you to all of you for watching Indeed. over the years. And thanks for all the great pals that came back today yeah. to celebrate. Something you want to say? Yeah. And there he is, the man who did last that long, the old grump, Roger Grimsby. Hey, Rock! <laughs> I got to tell you, I'll, I'll tell you. In I front. almost this, smile there. <laughs> you, almost, you almost lost your image. Here's the guy I admire greatly in news. Between he and Bill, one of the two of the greatest news guys I've ever worked with in my life. But, you know, there's always a story to get you and I are friends long enough. We, we would occasionally go out and enjoy a friendly libation together. And yet some stories went around this town, as you know, and you're a legend in this town. I know what you're driving at, Russell, <laughs> and the story followed me to New York. It has followed me everywhere I have gone. And that He's is, mad when he calls me I Russell. Was I was so yeah. sloshed on the air that I fell off the stool. It's not true. It broke. 
But one of my most memorable stories uh, broadcasting from Channel 7 here, ABC in its wisdom decided on a Christmas Eve to broadcast first from uh, St. Patrick's Cathedral in uh, New York, transfer to the cathedral in Chicago, and then end up here in uh, San Francisco. Two problems. One, we didn't have a cathedral. It had burned down. But the Catholic uh, diocese did have another church. We used that. The second problem, the stage manager. Uh, the cardinal is behind me. There's an altar light table. Cardinal is dressed in his gowns. He's holding a metal box, and the smoke of the incense is wafting heavenward. I'm supposed to make an expository statement. The camera pushes by me, and we go on. In my earphone, I hear from Chicago, 10 seconds. The stage manner leans over to me and says, his gown is gorgeous, but his purse is on fire. <laughs> that was back in the days when... <laughs> That was back in the days when they were in the minority. <laughs> Did I say that correctly? Right? Yes, you said it correctly. We'll forgive you. Let's hear it for a guy that not only was number one in San Francisco, became number one in New York for years, and he held reign there for a long, long time. Roger Gensler! Thank you. Well, the early day reporters had a very macho image, at least that's how they saw themselves, and television news wasn't yet a woman's world until well into the 1950s. The woman behind. Mrs. Back in the Edwin. 1950s, many of the important <laughs> interview shows and almost all the public affairs programs no, for Channel 7 were done Bradley by an amazing Bradley. woman named Wanda Rainey. <laughs> no, in 1957, she left us for Channel 5, where she became the very first woman to, to anchor a San Francisco Holloway television newscast. Today on the Noon News. Here she is, Wanda Rainey. Wanda Rainey. When I was just working at Channel 5 years ago doing a children's show, you and John Weston were doing the news. Yes, we sure were. And were. a very successful team, probably the most of all at that time. Mm -hmm. What was it like for a woman starting out and working? Well, you know, it was great because at the beginning, and I was it is live oh, television. Wait, just, just is this ignore live it. Television? It is live television. This is live television. Yes, right. Give young okay. folks a thrill. This I is what it's really like. I thought maybe they were commenting editorially. <laughs> no, not yet, anyway. Like that. Yeah. No, it was great. And um, I think I was uh, there at the right time. And uh, the world was ready, or certainly the Bay Area was ready, and all of us were ready for uh, for a woman to do the news. And I did, and I loved it, and I'm glad I did. Well, I understand yeah. that in those days, though, you used certain kind of props and things. Like, for example, it was a story I heard about using ice. Oh, yes. Well, you know, there weren't very many. We had very little film. We, had, we used all live stuff in the studio. Mm -hmm. We had an interview with a man who was going to be climbing one of the mountains in India. And it was going to be icy up there. So we got great big, huge blocks of ice and let him show yeah. how he was going to carve his way up that mountain. It was it, Dr. Will Syriac. It's a kind of prop that yeah. doesn't last a long time. It doesn't last though. Yeah, no, just only especially have that for about a week lights. and it's gone after huh? all that right, stuff. Right. Let's have a nice, let's hear for Wanda Ramey, who has been in this business a long time. She's a Thank terrific you. person. Thank you, Wanda. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. It's a delight to have you here. Thank very, you. very much. Okay? Thank you. Thank Wanda Ramey. Thank you. Great. But for a number of years, uh, eight years actually, I was general manager at KJO TV and in that position, one of my responsibilities that I hated was to broadcast a weekly editorial. Don't believe it. That's, <laughs> that's the one thing I really like about state, being a station manager, yeah. But then, I wasn't the first one who had to step out on editorial. This is the guy that made it tough for everybody else because he wanted to do it and every manager had. Here first. he is, a former general vice manager, vice Jack president, Hinson. David M. Sachs. David. It's kind of fancy. Guy brings his own stool. <laughs> David, how are you? I, since I owned everything in the building, I couldn't bring my own stool. <laughs> well, you would put that on. But you were. You were one of the first guys to go on to editorials, right? Yes, and there was a serious side to uh, being the first station to editorialize in the country, and I think it's important that it's stated now. Uh, we uh, had the problem in this city politically with the fact that the Chronicle was the most important uh, political entity here. And uh, the object uh, that we had was to neutralize their political strength in order that we could build that tall tower that now everybody sees up there on Twin Peaks. And so uh, having seen Phil Lasky, one of our great broadcasters over at Channel 5, try some editorials to see if they'd work, we decided, uh, with the help of our New York uh, brass, that we would neutralize uh, the Chronicle's problems 
uh, of political strength by editorializing daily. We did, and uh, then everybody in the country picked it up, and now the tower is there. And the tower is there. We call it Sachs's Monument. Let's hear it for <laughs> David M. Sachs. <laughs> Coming up, we're going to the thrill of victory, the agony of editorials, and some sportscasters remembering. And some of the most memorable events in the history of the Bay Area, as was covered by television during these 40 magic years. Happy 40th anniversary, Channel 7, from all of us at 2020. Despite being wonderful companions, my subject group scored low in all coordination skills, showed poor organization, and no decision-making abilities. Unless I can bridge the gap between us, this project will be canceled. Thank you. You're welcome. This weekend, last chance to save four dollars on each general admission with any Coke can. According to Car and Driver, there's one car that actually improves with age. After 30,000 miles, this car accelerated quicker, drove faster, and stopped more impressively than the day it was new. The BMW 3 Series. Other cars get worse as they get older. This one gets better. See your participating BMW dealer for details on new lease and finance options for the 325i. the examiner proclaims San Francisco dons long pants in the field of television tomorrow. The event marking its attainment of young manhood. In the opening broadcast of KGO TV, the American Broadcasting Company's video station. I became a man, but I want you to it's hear about this. time. Here's the really purple prose. The images that dance across your television screen on Channel 7 pour forth in a rushing stream of electrons from the peak of a slender and graceful tower on Sutro Heights. Not Barry Fitzgerald again. <laughs> In 1948, the American Broadcasting Company bought the mansion and the property for, are you ready, $125,000. Harry Jacobs, now retired, was named Director of Engineering. It was his job to put KGO TV on the air. I uh, had the, uh, the honor of receiving the first piece of gear for that tower. Now, you see, the tower consists of a lot of pieces of steel and a big foundation that we had to put in. And uh, then there's lighting equipment and all that stuff. So the first thing that shows up for this whole project is a package about four feet long and about a foot square. It's the beacon light for the top of the tower. That we need, you know. <laughs> oh, we ain't got a barrel of money. Maybe. Nobody knew anything about television except what we'd read in a few books. And so it was a, a novelty. And every day you came to work, it was fun. Because something new was happening every day, and you never knew what in the world was going to happen. Everything went on the air cold, yeah. and nothing was rehearsed. And it, it was really a, a, a great experience in living every day in that business. That's true. We were the only station we broadcasting from a mansion. But hey, poor old KPIX was jammed up into an attic somewhere up on the top of the mark. And when KRN came along just a few months later, they shoved them into a corner of the old Chronicle building. Yeah, but for all the grandeur of our surroundings, the ABC Network's offerings were pretty thin. 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 Tiny thin. Yeah. There was a simple reason our major prime time performers were wrestlers and boxers and roller skating gladiators. Sports coverage was cheap in those days, and the fledgling ABC television network was poor. Of course, there were no satellites, microwave links, and transcontinental cables, so the network sports we got on the West Coast were on film. And they came in the mail a couple of days after the bout or the game was over. So we broadcast a lot of local sports. The very first night on the air, Channel 7 piled a couple of cameras 
into the station's one remote truck and went to Emeryville to cover the season opener between the Oakland Oaks and the San Francisco Seals. Oh, by the way, Lefty O'Doul Seals were beaten by the Oaks two to nothing. We covered all the Oaks home games, and every fall and winter, we spent a lot of time in Kezar Stadium and in Berkeley and Palo Alto. San Francisco State, USF, UC, St. Mary, Stanford, and the University of Santa Clara. We covered them all. But as the years went on and the technology improved, ABC found it had earned a valuable reputation as the network for sports. Athletic events had become among the most important programs on television. The play-by-play -play announcers and commentators were major TV stars. When there were big conference games, World Series, championship contests, and especially during the Olympics, much of America stopped to watch television. Now we have a man who is part of that epic growth of television sports and he experienced so many of those athletic thrills and I haven't seen this guy in I don't know how many years until tonight and what the delight it is. Bob Phelps! <laughs> Here's a guy who went through sports and did a marvelous job at everything he tackled and then he raised a son who did pretty good too. Yeah, he's working for CBS Television now, making a hell of a lot more money, more money than I ever made here, I can tell you that. He did pretty good playing football, too, didn't he? Yeah, he did, 15 years. He was supposed to be a skinny little kid out of St. Ignatius. Nobody thought that he'd last one year, but he, he wound up 15, and I think he's headed for the Hall of Fame. Bob, in those days, I think the sportcasting was different, because you guys had to jump around and do everything. And how many different sports did you do here when you were in San Francisco? I think you did everything, didn't you? Well, as long as you could get a camera, <laughs> which was a little hard. <laughs> yeah, right. Days, yeah. But I started up at Citro, up in the fog up there, and it was a lover's lane, you know. On your way to work, there were a lot of interesting scenes you saw at 11 o'clock at night. To make <laughs> a different it. kind of sporting. Yeah, yes, right. you would pick yeah. up on that. No play-by-play, -play, however. You know. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was great. A lot of fun and uh, a lot of great sports. Of course, San Francisco has produced so many great athletes. But you're still now. You're still a broadcaster in New York and broadcasting. Company. ABC Radio Network in New York. Yeah, I'll cover the Giants tomorrow and the Phillies. So... I'm hanging in there. <laughs> I, might check you, I might check you later on a bet which way I should go. Bob Fouts, okay. let's hear it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Many a time I listened to 49er games with Bob Fouts calling those games. A lot of people knew and cared nothing about sports, however, became rabid fans just by watching television because perhaps of that sense that something unexpected could happen at any moment. This is the essence of live television. This is more the story of those who do not rage against the dying of the light and why. There's another kind of real-life drama that makes very powerful television, the documentary program. How about some peace to walk the streets towards the end of the My God almighty, in America, is that asking too much? A touching scene was from a documentary series reported by Evan White. And it was called Old Age, Do Not Go Gentle. And it won for Channel 7, the Robert F. Kennedy Award, a National Emmy, and a Peabody Award. And I don't know of anything that gave me more satisfaction in the years that I've been in the business and having done Old Age, Do Not Go Gentle. It was a time before people were thinking about the problems of the homeless and the times in the street. And the station went on to Washington, D.C. and changed legislation before the House of Congress with that two-hour show. And it's the proudest thing that I've ever done. Yeah, that was, that, that was terrific. Yeah, that was. That was. Now what we believe to be a television first and a Channel 7 exclusive. The debut of this medium of a venerable lady who holds an historic place, very historic, in the legacy of San Francisco. Now, but she reminds us, however, Jack, hmm? the yes. next time we'll meet some of the people who really bought the laughter to TV. And ladies and gentlemen, from the late land lamented, Wayland at the beach, Laughing Sal! I couldn't sleep at all last night. When I was tossing and turning, tossing and turning all night. Why toss and turn another night when you can rest easy on a new premium mattress from Otho? For three days only, when you buy premium king or queen sleep sets, you'll get this TV set absolutely free. That's Saturday, Sunday, or Monday. And you can always save up to 40% off department store prices. Hurry to Otho for savings up to 40%. You are not going to believe this place. You okay, dear? You'll find the land of sky blue waters in every hams. Hams, the refreshing. 
Register to win an Alaskan fishing trip and prizes from Daiwa and Igloo. Sweepstakes details at participating stores where hams is sold. We test the features of the GE Space Center 27 so thoroughly, it allows us to offer one more feature. One we're so proud of, we put it on all our major appliances. A 90-day full refund or exchange policy called Satisfaction Guaranteed. Because at GE, we believe you can never come too close to perfection. <laughs> well, during the, during the 50s, a television camera like this one was a basic okay. tool that, that we, we really had for training on the, on the TV stars and the early TV stars right in our studio and bringing it right into delivery. Look at that. Trying to road. fix this set like yeah, this. Yeah, fix it one, yeah. Among the very first to drop by Bay Area television homes on a regular basis was Dude Martin and his Hoffman Hayride Gang. Dude was already a vaudeville headliner in San Francisco when he started Channel 7's very first variety show in 1949. And he was a master at picking out talent. And one young singer on that show just seemed to have a very special promise, and it's a great big warm welcome. Let's give it to Rusty Draper. <laughs> How are you? Oh, it's great to see Good you. Good to see you. Where are you living then? Oh, I live up in Washington. The yeah. state of Washington. I live near uh, uh, Seattle. 32 yeah. miles from Seattle by a place called North Bend. And boy, you sprang out of doing TV here and had a big hit record. Tell them what it was. Well, I had Nightlife. It was a big, big record for me. And then, of course, Gambler's Guitar and several others. I, I got seven to gold records. He was a natural for live television. He and I did a show <laughs> for a half hour once a week for what, 26 weeks? I don't know how long we lasted. 26 weeks the last. Yeah. I, thank God. Uh, one night I thought we were going to get canceled <laughs> because right. it was for a company, a soap company I will not mention because they're very big. <laughs> but uh, we didn't help it any. <laughs> one, one night I said, look at that beautiful soap. That was my line. And Russ said, and look at this lovely opening door, the, the easy opening door. And it came right off. <laughs> He well, said, I told you it was easy opening. <laughs> well, as well as doing the commercial, it gave you a little comic relief anyway. Oh, yeah. Rusty, good yeah, to see you. A lot of fun. Good to see you. Good to be back. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Rusty, great. I mean, all my career is getting tarnished here. There was a time, however, during the mid-60s, when all our studios were turned into a, well, it was, it was kind of an unconvincing South Pacific island. I always suspected that the real point of the show was just to give this host a chance to kiss all the female guests. Watch. How long have you been married? About a year and a half. Well, see, and he's probably right here with you at the studio, is he, Donnie? He's not here? <laughs> Aloha. <laughs> well, for an explanation of what all that means, the original <laughs> kissing bandit, the man with the fastest lips in town, Blue Eye House, Bill Gordon. Bill. <laughs> Hey, that's oh, he's, he's, I like to see that. He's still throwing kisses again. Huh? Still throwing kisses. Got it from Dinah Shore. You know, this is really something. The, everybody in this area, the Bay Area, is mighty lucky to have Channel 7 here for 40 magic years. And I really think that they deserve all the praise they're getting. I'm, I came all the way from Cleveland <laughs> to say that. I'm just thrilled with this. This is a, and it's all live. This is actually happening at this moment while we speak. I just he came think, all the way from Cleveland just to see it. Just you know, any opportunity just to get out of there, right, Bill? <laughs> just got off the plane. I've got jet lag that won't quit. But that luau show was terrific. That was one. It was all Hawaiian, and we oh. had two little dancers on. Remember the twins? Two, yeah, Borden no. twins, little tiny little svelte girls. 450 pounds, but they were dynamite. <laughs> and, we, and we had dancers and singers, and we... One time, the boys in the band, live, live music tonight here. This, I love this. Wonderful. We had Julian Cannonball Adderley, used to live in Sausalito, oh, yeah. great jazz musician, came on the Luau show. And I said, well, I, you know, I'm embarrassed. I mean, you're a great jazz musician. We're, we're sort of a Hawaiian theme. He said, well, if you're a musician, you can play anything. And he played Aloha Oi 
Boy, you never heard anything like that in your life. It was the greatest jazz thing that ever happened. We had a lot of fun, and we used to give prizes. A two, you know, a week in Petaluma, first prize. I don't think people understand it, it, that in second those, prize, two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> but in those days, from the time we signed on in the morning until 5:30 in the afternoon, when we ran a movie, we were all live, and Lou Al made a great hour contribution. And Bill well, Gordon's delight to see you again. We loved it, and I'm, I tell you, it's good just to be here and to hey, see you, Russ. This is a great you. station, KGO. I love it. Thanks for very much. Good seeing Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Well, all through the 1950s, there was one guy who dominated afternoon programming on Channel 7. He did a variety show, and it was a class act with a live band and big-name guest stars. The afternoon TV audience remembers him as the host of the Les Malloy Show. And those of us in the business remember him as the man who could sell anything from potato peelers to vacuum cleaners. I'd say the great thing about doing this program has been getting a chance to meet the people that I watched when I was growing up in the Bay Area. Here he is, Les Malloy. Les? Hi, Les. Nice to have you here. Yeah, it's great to be here to see all my old friends, Bob Faust and all these good folks. Isn't that terrific? You are, uh, of course, still working on radio. Every and, night. Yeah, and doing, what was it called? Freeway Funnies. It's all comedy stuff, and the great thing is I lean on the great talent of the people, and all I have to do is talk in between. Yeah. It's not like television where you have to be a star all the time. star. You know? well, I went to your house, and, and Les has an entire setup in his house, a broadcasting place right upstairs, and right. turntables, and the rest of it. Well, I enjoy it. You know, being in this business, time goes by so fast, you don't even, you know, it, one day is... Boom, gone. Yeah, but you're the only person I know who was in broadcast in his early days who went around and bought a bunch of radio stations. How many stations did you own at one time? <laughs> Don't mean to embarrass you, Les, well, but that's my job. You know, I'm here, they said, go out, embarrass people, you'll get work. <laughs> well, the Bank of America was very nice to me, and I had seven at <laughs> one time. Seven radio stations, that's for Les Malloy. We're not right. going to feel sorry for you. We're glad Thank you're here you. tonight and still in the Bay Area. Thanks. Still here, still doing three way fun. Great. Thank you, Les, Thank very you much. Guys. Les Malloy. There you go. Thank you, Les. Well, the popularity of daytime variety shows continues right now into the 60s, as you can see. And when it was an opening on our morning broadcast schedule way back in 1964, some programming genius got an inspiration somewhere to pull in the morning women's audience. And he said, hey, let's do it with a handsome singing host. From San Francisco, it's the Dick Stewart Show. It's a most unusual day. Be like throwing my worries away As an old native-born Californian would say It's a most unusual day There's a most unusual sky Not a sign of a cloud passing by And if I want to sing from my heart again And now after 25 years, an encore for Dick Stewart! <laughs> I should point out that Richard and I, at one time, in some good years, were roommates in Sausalito. That's right. Keep your feet off the couch. Damn boy. <laughs> <laughs> and I could tell some stories. We won't be able to use them in this show right now. But I think my favorite story, Dick had a show, and you had a guest host come in with you every week. Oh, right? yeah, yeah. Name Bill, some of them. Oh, Bill Cosby, $500 a week. Um, <laughs> gee, uh, you know, I hardly remember this. I hardly remember the first half hour of this show. <laughs> I mean, it's, and it's not just because I'm getting old, is it? Yeah, but I remember one great wacko comic at the time. Uh, His name Pat was Pat Harrington, Harrington Jr. Now, you've right. got to tell him the story about Pat. Can I tell that? Yes, please tell us. Uh, he, we were trying to impress a lady, <laughs> and it was the final That's night... That's unlike you at the time. Yes. Oh, of course, yeah. Well, we were single. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And it was the final night of the of the awards banquet for the... Uh, there's no way we can tell this story. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, we used to do our show on tape, and, and we'd recycle the tapes, and they'd only last about long enough for Marty Pacetta to look at it and say, what, what were you saying there? <laughs> and, of course, we, we never knew. But, what, but you know, Mel Torme is at the uh, Fairmont, Hotel. Fairmont Hotel tonight, and uh, we, he, he sang with me once. And at rehearsal, when we were singing, as soon as I heard us together, I had to stop because I, I, I couldn't believe it was us, you know? It sounded so good. I want to invite everybody to join me over there tonight at the uh, Fairmont Hotel <laughs> and buy me a drink. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Stuart. Thanks, <laughs> There was a young comedian from San Francisco State, Sam Laughing already, who was appearing at the Purple Onion. He became a great favorite of TV hosts around town, or so he thought. And he was on the tube so much that it seemed like 
he had his own show. Well, not quite. He went to Hollywood to do that, but here he did everything from commercial pitches to comedy bits. This is the longest introduction we we're ever giving, and he became the only man to dominate local television strictly as a guest. And then for Fast Frozen to keep that subtle flavor, it's causing quite a lot of ch ch chatter. People are talking about it too. <laughs> Look for it in the frozen food section of your supermarket. Try Campbell's frozen clam chowder tomorrow. <laughs> Put the can up. <laughs> and then last week at the Pensacola, I was about, uh, probably about two lengths behind the lead car. There was only one ahead of me, and he slipped on some grease, and I just won that one, too. <laughs> well, wouldn't you say your success this year has been due to a little bit of luck? No, I'd say a little bit of grease. <laughs> of course, that was Ronnie Shell and Don Sherwood. Here's Ronnie Shell. Ronnie? <laughs> I Hi, saw fans. The, the most worried person in the audience who kept looking at his watch saying, am I going to get on? Am I going to get on? It's been a long show, but this is just a thrill knowing that Cotton Seed Clark is still alive. <laughs> it is. That's right. Thanks, Russ. Well, that's some information that we need to yeah. get. Yeah. I'd, I'd ask you for a funny story, but you have so many. There are so many. Would you like to tell one? Not really. I didn't think so. I saw... No, I just come here to say that it's, it's, I got my roots here working uh -huh. with all these shows, and I'm doing well now. I now have a home on both coasts, one in Tijuana, one in Newark. <laughs> and, um, I just, it's, I worked with you. Yeah. I worked with you and Don Sherwood and, yeah. uh, and how, man, Russ Cobb. How many times have we stood in front of a television camera and did an interview and laughed in each other's faces? <laughs> right? <laughs> Including tonight. Yeah, tonight. Yeah, right, that's right. Okay. Uh, how many phone calls did you make to get on this show, Ronnie? Twelve. That's what I thought. <laughs> yes. I know, calls. I know I got eight of them at home myself. And you're giving me about 20 seconds. No, you can have more time at the party afterwards. Everyone will remember you yeah, because you're on the television all the time. You are, and then yes, you show up. Yes, the night you saw Cotton C. Clark come to life, and <laughs> <laughs> Russ Coughlin died at the same time. Here we are. I gotta okay. go, folks. We're a little No, you don't. You stay right. You stay right here. Ronnie right Shell. Happy 40th anniversary, Channel 7. friendship knows no boundary. To men of dignity, courage, and valor. To everyday heroes everywhere, we offer our best. A beer smooth enough to be called a milk. place for kids to dine. Kids can feel at home there, and their food is really so divine. Danny's, what a truly perfect treat. Danny's, where it's such a joy to eat. Any, tinny, tinny. Danny's proudly offers our plate collection featuring the Flintstones. Three different plates, $1.49 each. The difference is a new and improved formula. The difference is it helps prevent performance robbing deposits. The difference is America's best selling high octane premium gasoline is now even better. New Shell SU2000. Experience the difference. deal of what those of us in television do for a living comes always comes kind of wrapped in kind of a gesture's cap and bells but we have have you thought about it you've gone into space while our astronauts you've seen a man walk on the moon and you've have you been beneath the sea with Jacques Cousteau and have you attended a live political convention or have you cheered an Olympic champion right at his moment her moment of victory if your answer is yes television has stretched your world and it stretched your life 
In September 1950, KGO TV and the California Academy of Sciences got together for the first local program to explain each week the world of science. It was broadcast live every Thursday, first with host Tom Grudy, then with Dr. Earl Harold, and that was a hit. I should say our animals of the week because they are Mexican jumping beans, and they come from the state of Sonora, in this part of Mexico. Here's El Paso, the Gulf, Lower California. And if, in your, if you are in Mexico, then you call them Brincadores Mexicanos. Notice these little fellows. You can see how some of them are more active than the others. Now, their movement is dependent upon the amount of heat that's present. The maximum jump that one of these has ever made has been some seven inches. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you got to understand in this age of space age technology, these revelations may seem a little less than earth shaking, but hey, in the 1950s, a jumping beam was a big deal. And even our own TV systems, as primitive as they were, seemed really magical, even to us who worked in it. One of the most successful programs of its time was fittingly called Success Story. And each week, they went to a different industry or laboratory and they explained how it worked. There was no tape, no film. Even back then, it was all done live. Okay, let's stand by for air. It's five we'll seconds. Show. Four, right. three, two, one. Up on one and cue music. Stand by for super on two. two. And super two, cue narrator. Success story. An on-the-spot live telecast from selected locations in the greater San Francisco Bay Area is brought to you each week as a public service by the Richfield Oil Corporation. For several months now, We've been wondering just what kind of a show to do for our anniversary program. So you wonder how we do it. Well, frankly, ladies and gentlemen, many times we wonder ourselves. I hope that we've all met before on previous success stories. My name is Bob Day. Here he is, Bob Day. Bob Day, here we are. A few years later. Thank you, Bob. We were asking ourselves that same question. You know, it was about a half hour ago. Tell me some of the things that happened on that show. At all lives, something had to happen every time you did it. Well, the, one of the big things of the show was the interview with the people in the plant. And one time we were doing Mother's Cake and Cookies over in San Leandro. Uh -huh. And uh, the interviews weren't scripted, but they were set up. In other words, I discussed with a man what I was going to ask him. So I was settled that I would ask him what the production of the plant was. He would tell me they put out $9 million worth of baked goods a month. And then I would ask him what was the distribution. He would tell me the western states in Alaska and Hawaii, which of course weren't states then. So fine, the show went along fine, and I got into the interview with this man. And I said, you know, we're very much impressed with the machinery we've seen here. And uh, what is the production of this plant? He said, well, Mr. Day, he said, in a month's time, we will produce in excess of $9 million worth of baked goods. And I registered amazement. I said, that's an ast astronomical figure. Tell me, Mr. Wheatley, where do all these baked goods go? And look at me, he says, you know, Mr. Day, sometimes I wonder myself. <laughs> <laughs> That's real management for you. That Cookie happened. management. <laughs> I no doubt it. Thank you, Bob, very much for being here. Thank you. Bob Day, success story. We're going to take a break now. We'll be back in just a couple of moments with lots more stuff. Don't go away. Happy 40th to Channel 7 from all of us at Monday Night Football. Presenting the perfect reconciliation between love of family and passion for driving. The innovative new BMW 5 Series sedan. This is supposed to be a small business, but I got news for you. I got 12 guys working for me, and they depend on me. Not just for their jobs, but also for their health coverage. And nowadays, you have to offer them HMOs, PPOs. You don't know what to do. You ever shop for health insurance? It can make you crazy. When you need answers, call on Blue Cross. If this is a small business, this should be a lot smaller job. We care about what's good for you.
We are gathered here today. You'd expect this Panasonic Omnimovie camcorder to shoot in daylight. If anyone believes this couple should not be married, let him speak now. You might expect this Panasonic camcorder to shoot in room light. Let him speak now. But what you don't expect is that it can shoot by the light of one candle. And it's VHS. Let him speak now. Camcorders that do the unexpected make Panasonic just slightly ahead of our time. I first heard country music at work. They play different stations on different days. Thursday is KSAN day. Kenny Rogers, KT Oslin, that Randy Travis. You know, I found myself looking forward to Thursdays and Saturdays and Sundays when I can listen on my own. Like they say, you don't have to be country to like country. Discover today's country on KSAN 94.9 FM. <laughs> Perhaps there's no more obvious barometer of change from one generation to another than the popular music of the day. Each decade, hey, we're having fun. I don't care what you're doing at home. Each decade finds a style to claim as its own. We can always blame the band. When Ken Joe TV was young, all the jukeboxes looked like this. And in 1949, it was, they were playing the Third Man's theme. They were playing Mona Lisa. Remember that King Cole? Bonaparte's Retreat. And band leaders like Stan Kent and Gene Krupa were major, major stars. Here, Hit Parade was a big on television. So were Perry Como, Frank Sinatra, and Bing Crosby. And on a more serious note, KGO-TV originated this series from the Richmond Auditorium. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And welcome to the Standard Hour. Presented for your enjoyment by the Standard Oil Company of California. In the 1960s, Channel 7 broadcast the San Francisco Ballet's Beauty and the Beast. We've always tried to put together some special musical Christmas present. I helped produce last year's show. It was called A Family Christmas. Beautiful! KGO produced special musical programs each winter and spring, featuring Bay Area students. This is from Young Sounds of Spring in 1978. We even had a production crew follow a San Jose song and dance troupe on tour south of the border. When international jazz legend Turk Murphy took his Yerba Buena jazz band to Carnegie Hall, of course, we had to go along. You know, a lot of musicians earlier started them right directly to television. Like there's Liberace, there's Lawrence Welk, the Monkees, and the most mysterious mysteri materialized right here in the Channel 7 studios. He became a star. He never uttered a single word. Not one. We bring you musical gems from near and far, blended into a pattern of glorious harmony. program based on the universal language of music, it is our pleasure to present to you Corla Pandit. Some say his music spoke for him, but lots of women say it was the eyes. Now, for the very first time, certainly for any of us in this studio, we'll hear the voice of Corla Pandit.
Carla Pendant, I got to tell you, I used to sit, you know, and I wasn't looking at his beautiful eyes or anything else in the music. We used to sit just fascinated. What do you think the quality was that you had just playing an organ, one individual, you went 15 minutes straight, no interruption of any kind, just playing? What is, what did that? Well, music sound is one of the most powerful forces in the universe. And I was attempting to communicate through music. We called it the universal language. Vibrate a string and all strings in tune vibrate in unison, and so does the heart of man. So that was my spirit of, of communicating through music, bringing people together through love and through music. So. You obviously did it, because I don't know of anybody in those times who was a bigger star in early television than you were, and I used to sit home mad, saying, well, gee, I could play a juice harp or something for 15 minutes, and, but this guy did it. You were wonderful, right, Jack? And I understand, Jack and I were talking earlier, that yeah. your, your son is a fine piano Yes, player. I have two sons, and they both play music, and they're into the keyboards and the new sounds, and we were sampling sounds, creating orchestral sounds from the very beginning, but now they have all the new samplers, but the, still each one has to be true to its own form. Uh, each instrument should be representing a soul force, and that's what my concept was. Not too technical, not pre-recorded, but actually expressing love through the music. Two things I'd like to say. One is, after not hearing you all those years and hear your beautiful speaking voice, you wasted that for many years on television. It's nice to hear you speak for the very first. Wouldn't you agree? That's Thank you. It really is true. Thank you. Very and, much. and secondly, I know that you are still performing in Southern California, other places. Isn't that true? Yes, we did a program about two weeks ago, or Phantom of the Opera, the original one, with the Lon Chaney and and uh, Philbin, Mary Philbin. And we did it at the Orpheum Theater with a big theater pipe organ coming up out of the lift. And I did a complete score from the watching the film show. Yeah. And right. this was recently. It's a pleasure to have you here and a, very, a great pleasure to meet you. Thank really. you great. very it's much. It's wonderful. I know and a lot of fans here. I want to thank here. all my friends. And you know, one of the things I remember most was the wonderful support I had from the group that worked with me, the car cameramen, Marty Pacetta, and all of them were wonderful. And I appreciated that, and we all had tears in our eyes when that program came to an end. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you.